Uh, welcome to our digital future and facial recognition confronting the tech to prison pipeline, co-hosted by the Cybersecure Policy Exchange at Ryerson University with a number of fabulous partners. Uh, I'll just go through them quickly here. Big Data at the Margins, Canadian Civil Liberties Association, Center for Free Expression, Creative Innovation Studio, Ryerson's Master in Digital Media Program, Open Media, Ryerson's Faculty of Arts, Lincoln Alexander Faculty of Law at Ryerson University, and the Ryerson University Library. My name is Kareem Bardizi. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Ryerson Leadership Lab, and we're thrilled that you can join us today for this uh, uh, two-part conversation um, at the very frontiers of responsible technology. Um, this, uh, today's event is part of our efforts at the Cybersecure Policy Exchange, which is an initiative dedicated to advancing public discussion and policy in cybersecurity and digital privacy, together with the Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst and powered by RBC. We've been especially engaged in advancing the responsible governance of AI powered facial recognition technology um, around which we have uh, re released uh, uh, some reports recently and we're excited to explore that uh, more today. Before we begin, I'd like to um, tell you uh, where I am um, and where Ryerson University sits uh, in the West End of Toronto and, and acknowledge the, what that land is um, and our work, uh, our continued work on this land. We do it as a symbolic and restorative act, one upon, among many to follow, a part of a wider ongoing, hopefully uh, transformative reconciliation project here at Ryerson University. Toronto uh, and Ryerson and where I am are on the territory of the uh, Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat. It is covered by the Dish With One Spoon Treaty, Treaty 13 and the Williams Treaties. Uh, we as organizations involved in this project are committed to honoring our obligations to these nations to, uh, treaties and to justice for Indigenous peoples more generally. Uh, how, how are we doing that or attempting to do that in this work? Uh, we hope that uh, through our work on the responsible governance of technology, we hope to amplify Indigenous voices and ensure that we're making space to consider the unique realities and digital injustices faced by Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, a, few, um, a few procedural things for us today. I wanna to point out the accessibility features for our online uh, conversation. You can access a live transcript of this session and a separate window. In the top left of corner of your Zoom screen, uh, you'll see a red button that says live. You can click the arrow that appears next to the text after the red live button, and you'll be given the option to view the transcript. If a pop-up appears prompting you to ma uh, make an account, just click X, uh, you don't need it to, to access the transcript. We're also uh, recording the first Q&A part of this event, and we'll be posting that in the coming days. Um, and uh, we're really thrilled uh, with the lineup uh, that you're gonna hear about in a second. We hope that by hearing from different perspectives, artists, researchers, uh, those who have been impacted by algorithmic technologies, we can come together to discuss how these technologies should be governed in Canada. And with that, I'll pass it off to your host today, um, our own UN Stevens Policy Lead at the Cybersecure Policy Exchange. Hello everyone and welcome to the event today. I'm really excited to be part of these two conversations with leading thinkers and I'll be your host for today's event. Today's event. Um, we're so lucky to start the conversation today with um, the Sundance Festival acclaimed documentary code advice director, Shalini Kantaya, which impacts what it means when artificial intelligence or AI increasingly governs our liberties and what to do with the invasive and discriminatory impacts of this technology. For those of you who haven't seen the film yet, the documentary follows MIT Media Lab researcher Joy Bolamwini's discovery that many facial recognition algorithms do not accurately detect darker skin faces or correctly classify the faces of women. This started a longer conversation of widespread bias in algorithms that eventually led her to help table legislation for the US government. As it turns out, AI is not neutral and women are leading the charge to ensure that our civil rights and fund fundamental freedoms are protected. With that, I'll introduce our two, first two speakers. We have the amazing Professor Richard Latchman, who is the Director of Zone Learning for Ryerson University, a network of 10 incubators across the country. He's a Director of Research Development for the Faculty of Communications and Design, Director of the Experiment, Experiential Media Institute, and an Associate Professor of Digital Media at the RTA School of Media. He's a multi-time graduate of MIT, a Gemini Award-winning producer, and is a creative and technical consultant for new media, new media projects primarily focus on entertainment and transmedia properties. And last but not least for this portion of the event, we have Shalina Kantaya, who I teared up when I saw join the event today because I'm just so honored to be in her presence. Um, as we all know, she directed and made Coded Bias, which premiered at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival to critical acclaim. She won a SEMA award for best director and has been nominated for a Critics' Choice 
um, a Cinema Eye Honors, and an NAACP Image Award, among many others. Her debut feature, Cash in the Sun, premiered at the LA Film Festival and was named a New York Times critic pick. And that film released globally on Netflix on Earth Day 2016 with the executive producer Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio, very casual, and was nominated for the Environmental Media Association Award for Best Documentary. She directed the season finale of the National Ge Geographic Television Series Breakthrough. She's a TED Fellow, a William J. Fulbright Scholar, and an associate of the UC Berkeley Graduate School of, Jur of Journalism. Thank you so much to the both of you for joining us today. And with that, I'll pass the mic on symbolically to Professor Lashman to lead this Q&A. Uh, thanks so much, Jan. Uh, it's really great uh, to meet all of you. I see all of you and know you're virtually present. Uh, nice to meet you, Shalane. Um, first of all, congratulations on the film. It's a, a fantastic uh, work. And uh, I love that you've been doing uh, this supported version of putting the film out there by doing these hosted uh, Q&A sessions. I know there've been hosted screenings around the world uh, and now the film's on uh, on Netflix. So uh, maybe I wanna, I wanna divide into the questions into two areas, one a little bit about the content and one a little bit about the, the filmmaking process. So um, I know you're not an AI research scientist, but you have done a deep dive into the top minds in the world. Um, so can, can you tell me what is the risk of uh, facial recognition as it is currently uh, out in the world? And it's somewhat flawed case and, and your interview subjects go into this, but what, what is the larger risk to society in this case? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's such an honor to be here. And it's um, really conversations like this one that give my life's work meaning. Um, so thank you to everyone for making time um, to be here in, in, in this really important conversation. Um, I, I, it is actually very true that I, unlike this astute panel that you've assembled, um, knew nothing about, I didn't even know what an algorithm was three years ago and everything that I sort of knew about artificial intelligence came from the mind of Steven Spielberg. And I don't think I really understood um, my sort of background as a sci-fi fanatic. I'm definitely someone who's watched Blade Runner too many times, um, really prepared me to understand the way in which um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, AI is really becoming a gatekeeper um, of opportunity and deciding really important things like who gets hired, who gets healthcare, how long a prison sentence someone may serve. And I think um, at the same time as I was learning about, you know, the ways in which we are outsourcing our decision-making to machines in ways that really change lives and shape human destinies, I came across the work of Joy Bellamwini. And um, her startling discovery of racial bias in artificial intelligence. And, you know, she was just a graduate student at the time and just trying to make an art project work, something very um, sort of pedestrian, ordinary, you know, low stakes. And, discovers that the camera won't see her face and actually has to put on a white mask that is whiter than anyone's face. No one's face is this white. And the camera sees the white face, but doesn't see her actual dark skin. And I think for me, what was so startling about that, that first scene that opens coded bias is that this was not a technology that was sitting on a shelf somewhere being beta tested. This was technology that was already being sold to our FBI, already being sold to ICE, our immigration officials, already being sold and deployed by police departments all across the United States. And I was terrified to learn that uh, no one that we elected no one that represents we the people was giving any kind of oversight to its um, use. And you had big tech selling this facial recognition technology directly to law enforcement. And further than that, Joy's research, groundbreaking research along with Dr. Timnit Gebru and Deborah Raji showed that this technology was racially biased, was gender biased, 
And what I began to see is the high stakes for which this could hurt people. And I think with facial recognition, and I'm I'm so grateful to Ryerson to putting this conversation on the on the sort of forefront of facial recognition, is that I feel as an outsider who didn't understand algorithms, this was the easiest to sort of understand. It was the most visual. It was the most personal. This is your biometric data. Um, it can be likened to your individual fingerprint or a DNA swab, so both things here in the US that we need a police warrant to access, right? So this is very private, personal data that makes you individually identifiable. And it was, and it was racially biased, invasive surveillance technology that was being massively deployed at scale um, throughout our culture. And I think um, this particular technology, facial recognition, I think has the deepest, most far reaching implications for free people living in a democracy. And I think that is because um, it can track you um, the way that China is using it to, um, you know, um, to detect people when they go to mosque and people would just stop going to mosque because if you know you're going to get your face scanned, are you going to do that thing? And in the same way, if you go to protest, like many people did here in the US and law enforcement is going to scan your face and be able to pull up your social media profile. Are you gonna do it if you've got probation status or immigration status or um, any kind of, um, uh, you're on public assistance or you have any kind of vulnerability throughout our culture? And so it has this sort of chilling effect um, and it dovetails with so many things. And even if we had this sort of right application you have companies that are scraping the internet for this data and creating um, profiles about us. And I think, you know, for me coming from outside, I had often heard about these things framed around privacy, which I have a very kind of emotional disconnect from. I, I don't really know what that's about. And it feels like a nice to have. And I think the more accurate term is actually invasive surveillance. Uh, this is the kind of uh, surveillance that makes the East German Stasi look like they had a light touch, like they were cute, the kind of information that they could gather about us. And um, what I perceived was that we had democracies picking up the tools of authoritarian states um, with no rules and protections um, you know, around that. And so you can have companies like one was scraping our, um, our dating profiles and looking at people because they identified as uh, gay or straight. I don't think they did the non-binary on that spectrum, but I think they did gay or straight. And they started to input this data associating people's faces nice. with, their, um, with their sexual orientation. And um, basically they could find out with 91% accuracy for men if you were gay or straight and 81% accuracy for women if you were gay or straight. And so it, it had these kind of, um, you could see easily how this could be misused. And on top of that, I think with facial recognition, what I've come to see is also just a bunch of pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. um, it's only through making this film, and I'm so grateful to the cast of the film for schooling me and giving me an education and um, helping me become literate and helping me share that literacy with an audience that maybe isn't trained um, in these technologies. Because you know you have companies like HireVue who are saying we can judge if a candidate is a good candidate based on the facial expressions of your face, 
And I know now that that's pseudoscience, that's bogus and that's baloney. And yet it becomes this new form of power, this new gatekeeper. And um, I just wanna say one last thing to your question, um, which is what is at stake here? And um, I don't think I've ever recovered um, as many times as I've seen my own film um, of seeing a 14 year old child um, in school uniform, a black child uh, being stopped by five plainclothes police officers and fingerprinted and held and never explained why and why that was so disheartening to me is that that's the moment of child, that child's life is not the same again. Like that, that is a moment of trauma. And I think that um, that is a moment where we failed to recognize his inherent dignity as a human being. And what is so chilling about that from where I sit in the United States is that I had to go to the UK to, to capture a scene like that. Um, there are no laws here in the United States that would make that process transparent to me. And it was only in the UK, which was then a part of Europe, and I don't know what will happen with their data rights protections now that they've exited, but um, it was only in that context that um, the police had to make that process transparent and have, and that's why human rights observers at Big Brother Watch could follow that scene. And I could capture police experimenting uh, with facial recognition. And uh, Patricia Williams, a legal scholar who I, I, was, I was privileged to be on a panel about, really reframed this in an amazing way. She said, they call this artificial intelligence um, trialing artificial intelligence, we're testing artificial intelligence. What it really is, is human experimentation. And um, that is what is at stake here. And with facial recognition, uh, what will happen when we trust it with lethal autonomous weapons, um, which I would include self-driving cars in lethal autonomous weapons. They have the power to literally take someone's life. And um, so that is how much is I feel at stake here with this specific technology of, of facial recognition. There we go. Uh, th thanks for that. I, I, I very much appreciate that you're describing um, facial recognition as one part of and maybe a, a very visible part of the larger questions of machine learning. Uh, and um, it, one, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, Master Zulowski says that machine learning is, is money laundering for bias. It's a, it's a way of hiding what are all the biases that are built into where we get the data, uh, the, the societal biases we might have, the historical biases that are fed into something, and they turn it into a number. They turn it into you know, a, a green or red, yes or no kind of question. Um, and so I, I appreciate that metaphor because it makes something very complex understandable. And I think you're, what you're describing here is, is the challenge of this. It's a complex, you know, you're talking about very sophisticated technologies that are posting millions or in some cases of Clearview AI, billions of records, uh, very deep learning, uh, very, very deep, um, computer science based algorithms that for most of us are beyond our understanding. So, so how do you go about making that understandable to, to a general audience? Because that it, it seems like the goal of this film is not computer scientists talking to each other. You are trying to serve the role of communicator uh, to, to, to get people angry, to get people interested, to get people knowledgeable at a certain level. How do you, um, yeah, how do you go about translating that into something we can well, well, thank you for that. I, I, and you're right. I, I think that I didn't make this film for technologists. It's been quite a shock that so many technologists and technology companies have, have been eager to show the film, which I, I'm so grateful for. But I think when it comes to AI, 
um, all of the knowledge has been in the hands of the few. So all of the power has been in the hands of the few. And one of the things I hope to accomplish with Coded Bias was sort of to pull out a chair for all of us and welcome us to have a seat at the table because we are the audiences that these technologies are experimented on. These technologies are designed and deployed on all of us. And so that was really important. Um, that being said, I couldn't talk to people at parties for two years. Uh, <laughs> this was made before COVID and there were parties and I assure you, I was scared to go to them because I didn't know uh, how to answer that question of what are you working on right now? And I think the working title of my film was Racist Robots. <laughs> And so I would often say, well, I'm making a film about how, how, how machines can be racist and sexist. And all of a sudden I'd be like alone at the punch bowl. I'd see the person's eyes glaze over. And um, so it was a massive, I had never seen this topic in film before. I had never seen another uh, documentary or episode that had to do with this subject matter before. So it was brand new content and I spent a lot of time marinating. I just had to digest all the data. It was um, incredibly, not all the data, all the stories. I mean, it was just incredible to me. And I think what kept me on the journey was I was, my eyes were opened. It was eye-opening and jaw-dropping for me. And um, I was really grateful to the incredible, brilliant, and badass cast of the film, because not only are they some of the smartest human beings I've ever talked to, I mean, advanced degrees from Harvard and MIT and um, every other elite institution under the sky, but also they had an identity that was marginalized. They were women, they were people of color, they were LGBTQ, they were religious minorities. And I think having that identity that wasn't marginalized allowed them to shine a light in, into um, some of the blind spots that Silicon Valley missed. And I think what that is common to the film. And I think that the film is actually very representative of the audience who is uh, of the people who, of the demographic that is leading um, the, the fight for against bias and for greater ethics in AI. And I'm grateful for them giving me an education. And I think that I relied a lot on the visual language of science fiction, which is actually the part that I knew. <laughs> and so I knew the whole history of science fiction and um, I leaned very much on that visual language of science fiction because I think many people, I'm more like mainstream society who knows about AI through the imagination of science fiction filmmakers. And I learned in the making of this film that there's always been this dialogue between science fiction writers and filmmakers and artists and actually AI developers. And that Marvin Minsky, who used to run the AI lab at MIT, uh, is regarded as one of the fathers of AI, is, was actually friends with Arthur C. Clarke, uh, the science fiction writer who wrote Stanley Kubrick's 2001 um, and created HAL, that evil robot. And so my film sort of pays homage to the language of science fiction and helps us to understand that through the, that lens. Uh, that being said, I didn't, uh, I wasn't prepared for the fact that so many young people had not seen 2001. <laughs> I did a screening to high school students. I'm like, how many have seen 2001? It was like, no one. I was like, stop what you're doing. <laughs> Go right now, run. Um, and so um, uh, that was really important. And so that being said, you know, trying to boil someone's PhD dissertation down to two minutes that's entertaining and cinematic and visual, uh, make the, the unseen visual was a challenge. And then the other part was to connect that science and technology to the stakes, to the people who have skin in the game, to the people who are most impacted. And I think oftentimes these technologists are not actually in touch 
with the communities that they're impacting. And sometimes there's a naivete, like, you know, someone who's working on facial recognition might be thinking, we are going to detect the early onset of autism. And that is all they are working on. And facial recognition is awesome to them. And they're not thinking of um, the UK citizen that gets stopped arbitrarily by law enforcement for pulling up the, just wearing a scarf over his face because he doesn't want his face recognized. And, uh, you know, as free people, we're not supposed to be arbitrarily ID'd by police, you know, just to remind you. And that's what facial recognition does. And so to me, it was really important to connect the science to the heart led stories and to tell a story of technology in a way that centers our humanity. And not only just um, people who were impacted, but people who were challenging power. And when I think about someone like Trine Moran or Issa May Downs in my hometown of Brooklyn, who their landlord arbitrarily sends them a note saying, we're going to put facial recognition in and you have to opt out. It's not even a willful consent. You have to opt out. And not only did they organize, and they didn't even know what biometric data was at the time. And not only did they get educated and get empowered with legal, a legal team at Brooklyn Legal, but and educated their 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 neighbors and their community. And not only did they keep the landlord from installing facial recognition, this racially biased invasive surveillance technology but they also inspired the first legislation in the state of New York that would protect other residents from the same. And so it was really important for me to tell those heart-led stories so that we remind ourselves what is at stake here. And I think uh, when it comes to cinema, the reason I make films is it's my belief that they change the world. And that is through the radical experience of empathy. Um, I think uh, I, call, I always call it the sacred space of the independent cinema hall, where you sit in a dark room and you have this experience of identifying with someone radically different from your from yourself. And it's my belief that, um, you know, Roger Ebert, the film critic called um, film empathy machines. So it's my belief that people don't care about issues, but they care about people. And when you empathize with someone that's different than you, um, it's my belief that that is actually the spark of social change when we feel for someone that is different than us. And that is the thing that machines can't do, have empathy. So that, that, that's wonderful. I love the, the description of the motivation and the how to accomplish that. So, so let me ask, and I think we're running short of time, this might be the last one, but this is a question that comes uh, on the Slido, people have upvoted this, and it comes up anytime we talk about these large issues, is system-wide issues. So the subjects of your documentary, uh, Joy and Tim Ned and Kathy O'Neill, they are speaking to legislators. They are speaking to technology CEOs or engineering leads about what to do about these issues. You with your film are speaking to us. Mm -hmm. What is the ask to us as a general audience? There's a empathy side of this, a feelings side of this, but what would you hope this film can do in us? What's the action we can take is it, yeah, I mean, storming the legislature? Well, actually, I can't even use that parallel anymore. There's been too much storming the legislature lately. But, <laughs> uh, what, what is the activity that you would like us to take having watched this? So we're not just sitting at home in front of Netflix saying, oh, that's terrible. Oh, and yes. And I, I just want to say, I've seen sea change in the making of this film. IBM got out of the facial recognition game. They disrupted their business model. They're done. Uh, Microsoft said they would stop selling facial recognition to law enforcement. And Amazon said they would take a one-year pause. And that happened for three things. And this is my ask. One is, um, I know that there's some scientists on this call. And we need more um, brave scientists, unencumbered like of uh, of corporate interests like uh, Joy Belmwini, like Dr. Timnit Gebru, like Kathy O'Neill, who are in these rooms where these decisions um, are made. And we need more scientists who um, bring their humanity into the room. And when something, when they are in the room where these decisions are made, um, have the courage to speak out and to bring 
uh, us all into the room. So I think that's important. And it's my hope that, you know, at institutions like Ryerson, that we have a massive inclusion campaign in these technologies. And that starts with how computer science is taught. Uh, when you have a industry that has less than 14% women, there is a massive inclusion problem. And um, it is my belief that you're seeing this new generation of computer scientists who are saying, I need a woman's studies course. I need a black studies course. I need an ethics course. I can't learn about, about uh, I can't program for society if I don't know anything about society. And when we do that, when we create more interdisciplinary education around hey, how AI is taught, it will bring and attract more people to the field because women will say, the study of the technologies of the future is about me too. And um, I think that, that Silicon Valley has a massive inclusion problem that it needs to be addressed. Uh, and it's my hope that institutions like Ryerson will be part of that pipeline um, um, that, that, that cultivates these new leaders in these fields. The second thing is we need massive AI literacy. And I would not underestimate the power of literacy. Um, I hope people will show this film. You can go to codedbias.com. There's a take action page with a bunch of study guides. Um, and my, my favorite comments are like, my grandmother loved it. My 12 year old son loved it. And that is important because unless we understand as a public how this new form of opaque one um, sided power works, we can't challenge that power. And um, becoming literate around AI empowers us to know what questions to ask and how to take action. So I would not underestimate the power of literacy. And just to underscore that the Communities that have been um, most literate, places like San Francisco, Oakland, Cambridge, Boston, have been the first to pass local policies. All of those cities have banned facial recognition by law enforcement and in their municipalities. And that is because they are technological hubs and they understand how these systems work. Um, and so that is the power of literacy. And whenever we pass local change, um, you know, as these, uh, as big tech scrambles to get into higher education and you're seeing uh, institutions like yours use facial recognition to judge cheating on tests and, and rate students for their intention, um, your local school's policy makes a difference. And whenever we pass local policy, be it at your school banning facial recognition, having uh, policies around data protection, having no surveillance of students in their homes when they're taking tests, um, creating that kind of environment. Whenever we pass local policy, we disrupt the power of big tech. Um, so that's really important. And then the last thing is that, you know, the changes that those the three of the big multinationals made around facial recognition, those policy changes happened in June, 2020. And that timeline is incredibly important because Joy and Timnit's re and Deborah's research had been out for two years. My film had been out for six months. And that timing is really important because that's when you had uh, tens of thousands of people of all colors in the streets in the largest movement for civil rights and equality that we've seen in 50 years around the unjust murder of George Floyd. And I think the convergence of those, through th of those three things, brave scientists unencumbered by corporate interests, massive AI literacy, hopefully brought about like small films like mine, and, um, and civic participation in government. Um, and people drawing the connections between uh, racially biased invasive surveillance in the hands of law enforcement with no one we elected watching and the communities that are most brutalized and stand the most to be hurt by these technologies. 
people making those connections and letting our voices be heard um, in the same tradition of, of other civil rights movements, um, writing to your legislator, um, having a nonviolent um, action, um, those kinds of things make a difference. And so to me, what I, what I just wanna conclude with saying is that our biggest obstacle is not actually big tech. It's our own apathy and belief that we can make a difference. And it is my belief in making this film, and I am a black turtleneck wearing New Yorker with very pragmatic ideas about social change, that we have a moonshot moment. Um, that, that this is our moonshot moment where the cement is still wet in these technologies and we have a chance to, 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 to put our hands in that wet cement and, and put our mark of our democratic values. And so um, this is our moonshot moment to push for greater ethics and, and great more of our humanity in these technologies that will redefine our societies, our democratic societies. Uh, th thanks, I really appreciate that. Uh that sense of contextualizing what you've made in this larger conversation, which is happening more and more right now about the role of technology in, in our lives and that facial recognition, or even the wider set of machine learning is also, we're talking about social media and its effects on social cohesion. Uh, uh, there is a sense of a, a backlash to, if not privacy, and I, I appreciate you're your saying the word privacy might not strike a chord with people, but that thought of surveillance maybe does. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and invasiveness does. So to that end, that, that this is part of a wider conversation, um, uh, some of the questions uh, on the slide or somebody was asking, as a filmmaker, there are many stories that you were looking at here. Were there storylines you had to leave out or clips you had to leave out to, to achieve the focus that you have uh, here? There is a whole series on the cutting room floor. <laughs> And um, um, many, many people that I would have loved to have featured and I just could not have, but I feel like almost every sector of society could have had its own film. And I hope that Coded Bias is the beginning of many, many more films on these issues. Um, have you, uh, so uh, tell me a little bit about the reaction you're getting from, from the public or from these communities. You've been saying technology companies are sometimes inviting screenings. Um, do you have any, and, and forgive, forgive my, uh, my uh, uh, sometimes worry that uh, you, you're talking about the need in education, for example, for ethics classes. And sometimes we have a way of saying, oh, ethics are important. We'll do like one week on ethics, and then the other four years will be not on ethics, apparently. Um, or as a company, oh, I see people are maybe talking about this. We'll, have, we'll, we'll show a film, and then we'll go right back to business as usual. Mm -hmm. Have you seen evidence of change in companies right now. You, talk, you mentioned IBM as a, as a good example of saying we're, we're actually getting out of this business. Mm -hmm. uh, have you seen examples where this is not just legislation or not just uproar, but it's actually coming up from the technology workers who are not all white CEO billionaires. They are us, they are the people on this call. They are, they are far more representative, not perfectly representative, but there is more representation than just at the top. Yes, I mean, I think IBM getting out of the facial recognition game is not small. <laughs> I mean, disrupting your business model and saying we're closing down shop of this is it wasn't a small move to make. It wasn't a gesture. It was it was actually putting their money where their mouth is. So I would not underscore that. Um, and but I think that if I have a mantra, it's don't leave the tech tech bros alone. <laughs> The tech bros can't be alo left alone on this stuff. It should not be up to them um, whether they pick up and put down these technologies. Someone that we elected should be giving some sort of government oversight. Um, and I think we saw that with the firing of Dr. Timnit Gebru from Google uh, for shining a light on some of the bias and ethics issues at Google. And that sent a chilling effect um, to the entire industry um, that shows, and she was heading up AI ethics within Google. And so, and one of few black women to do so, and quite frankly, Google can't afford to lose her genius um, from, their, from their roster. And so um, what that shows us is that it should not be up to technology companies alone uh, any more than we can trust fossil fuel companies to self-regulate. We actually need some laws. And it's my belief that regulation um, 
uh, basically sparks innovation. Um, when people often ask, you know, don't you think they're good uses of these technologies? I'm like, yes, I'm a huge techie. The fact that I believe in a, an FDA, a food and drug administration, uh, doesn't mean I don't like food. <laughs> it means that I, I believe in a certain standard of health and safety. And we are living in an industry that I would liken to like the automobile industry without seat belts and a car seat for your baby. It's like having pharmaceutical products with no uh, counterindications and no usage instructions on the label. Like we, no ingredients either, you know? And so I feel very strongly that policy is just not keeping pace with technology companies. And the, the, the pressure point should not actually be on the tech companies to self-regulate, but on policymakers to regulate. And I think um, Europe gives us a great example of that with the GDPR. And that, that is the first legislation that really puts data rights in a, in a civil rights framework, puts data rights in a human rights framework. And they just passed another set of legislation I didn't have time to review at any length. Um, in, in uh, just a few weeks ago that puts more legislation on um, AI. And if the great nation of Canada would do the same, um, would put greater legislation on these type of technologies, it would help us in the US because these big tech companies don't wanna do one set of policies for Canada and one set for the US. And so um, it's my hope that perhaps our, our more our kinder, more moral, more ethical neighbors to the north might also um, pass legislation that would help protect civil and, and human rights in these fields. It, it's my role as a Canadian to say, it's not all sunshine and roses up here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think we're at time. It's actually also very fitting that my extra lighting that I have to have to have the camera pick up my skin tone died during the... the <laughs> Um, I want to thank you so much for both the film, for your uh, frankness and your understanding of being um, a passionate translator, someone who's able to take these deep issues and bring them to a wider group to, to make the change in the society. So I, I thank you for the role you were playing uh, in being alone at the punch bowl at the party, <laughs> obsessively thinking, how are you going to turn this into language for the rest of us? Uh, thank you so much. Congratulations on the film. Uh, and uh, you end back to back to you. Excellent. Thanks so much. It was an honor. Thank you so much both uh, Dr. Lachman and Shalina for being here today. It, it, it's just like, incredible. And I feel like your call to action is something we all need to hear, especially. Like, thank you so much again to you both.